it's a very, it's a strong pleasure to be here. Um, the residents may not know, but UCLA and Seattle have a very long and sometimes competitive history in the field of epilepsy and epilepsy surgery, uh, which your formatter, George Ogerman, is in the audience today. So George, it's good to see you. Uh, I've known George throughout my entire career. And George dates back to, and I'll show you some pictures in a little bit of even the beginning. So, to start off with, uh, goals today. Um, we'll try to keep this reasonably simple, but uh, I'm going to spend a good chunk of the first half on, on helping you understand that how is epilepsy surgery in children <laughs> different than epilepsy surgery in adults? And the key there is understanding this concept of what we refer to as the epileptic encephalopathy and how surgical intervention may or may not have an impact on that. <coughs> uh, we will then go into and talk a little bit more about what is epilepsy surgery in kids, compare and con contrast that <coughs> with, um, uh, with what we see in adults. And then finish off with a little bit more of some of the basic science, some of the physiology we've been doing over the years, which does go back to, to a history that interrelates uh, with your programs here and throughout the year. So because in today's world we've got to do all these conflict of interest, whatever, um, the only financial disclosures I will give you is that I still am on the data management committee for NeuroPACE a device that has now been entered in the market. Uh, I used to be the editor-in-chief of Epilepsia, but that, I'm retired from that job. So that's the only other conflict of interest I have. All right, and I'm going to dedicate this to two people. So the Epilepsy Surgery Program at UCLA was started by these two gentlemen. On the left is Paul Crandall, who was the first epilepsy surgeon at UCLA from 1961 until his retirement in 1987. And the first neurologist was a man named Richard Walters, who was then the head of the Department of Neurology at the time. Similar in some ways to, to a programs that you see throughout the country where there's a team of clinicians and other scientists involved. And that's an important point here. Um, Paul was my mentor toward his retirement. And so I dedicate I dedicate this. Neither of these men are alive to today, but um, I think it's important to understand that we all, there's a tradition that we all stand on. My team through the year has been through collaborations with a number of different groups in a variety of different departments. In the research lab, I've had the for good fortune to have a number of excellent people who've worked with me. And I've uh, done a collaboration doing single cell electrophysiology with Mike Levine's laboratory, specifically Carlos Cepeda, who has been <coughs> working with me for 20 years. Um, I work with Mariko Salomon, who's one of the Cracker Jack uh, neuroradiologists. Much of the work I'm going to talk to you about would not be possible without the distinct collaboration with our neuropathology colleagues, which you just can't do it without them. I work closely with pediatric neurology, and at the end of the day, after a long, how many hours of taking out half the kid's brain, when I can turn cases over to the PICU, pick uh, it's a great collaboration to have. All right, so central theme. What's different between kids and adults? I think the single biggest way to kind of put this in place is through the following two statements. So in the year 2000, <coughs> there was an NIH-sponsored meeting that was focused on epilepsy. It was a White House-initiated conference that brought together for the first time professionals and lay people in the same room to talk about what should be the ultimate goal in treating people with epilepsy. And they came up with this phrase. The ultimate goal should be no seizures, 
no side effects, and then it was later amended about four or five years later to add as soon as possible. And now you see kind of a little bit of So the goal of treatment for anyone with epilepsy is to stop the seizures. And then to give people as much of a development as they or as much of a life normal life as they can. For the developing brain, in uh, a group of us got together through the International League Against Epilepsy, and in 2006 uh, modified this for the kids to make it a point that for the developing brain, you want to eliminate seizures as soon as you can developmentally to optimize the development of these kids. And this focuses immediately that in epilepsy and intractable seizures in children, the key thing you're concerned about is what do the seizures do to the developing brain? And that is this concept of this epileptic encephalopathy. Now this has been defined, it's argued about a little bit, but generally people will, will agree with that it's a progressive encephalopathy in which there is uh, problems in cognitive and neurologic disabilities. The direct consequence either of the, of the, of the seizures or continuous <coughs> abnormal EEG activity that you can see. Most of these conditions are age related and are seen in the developing brain, although I would, I, I would make the argument that in my days before I did mostly kids, that there is a, also an epileptic encephalopathy that you see in adults with chronic uncontrolled seizures. It takes a long time to to classify it and categorize it, but if you look, IQs of individuals with epilepsy who are adults decline over 20, 30 years of their lifetime. So there is an epileptic encephalopathy in adults. It's just not as well appreciated. So the focus of the work at UCLA centered originally on this condition. Let's see if the audio is not working too good. Oh well. Basically, this is an example for the pediatric neurologist. They'll see this and they'll, go, they'll recognize the immediately. This is infantile spasms, a particular seizure type, <coughs> which is specific for children, usually less than one year of age. This condition is associated with a very characteristic EEG signature. It's referred to as hypsarrhythmia. Very high voltage, chaotic EEG. And with the spasm, as you can see in this here, there's an electrodecrement. These events can occur multiple times in a day. Now, infantile spasms is linked with one of the worst epileptic encephalopathies that we know of clinically. This is a study from some time ago, but it's still relevant today. A group of individuals who they and notice the scale here. These are Z scores. So of the different epilepsy syndromes, what are the ones that are what are the factors, clinical factors that are linked with the worst developmental outcomes? And the first one that comes up is the type. If you have a history of infantile spasms, the mean IQ is three standard deviations below the mean. I mean, this is a devastating encephalopathy. <coughs> the other thing to kind of follow on this is that the other groups that are also worse off are those with focal epilepsies, either in the frontal, temporal, or parietal lobes. So the two types of epilepsy that are associated with the worst cognitive outcomes are generalized, or referred to in the old days, generalized symptomatic epilepsy. These terms now have been uh, change. I was on that committee. We argued vehemently because about whether infantile spasms constitutes a generalized versus a focal epilepsy. But focal epilepsies and infantile spasms are the worst. The other factors that come into play are younger age and seizure onset. If you have seizures that begin less than one year of age, then the risk of a significant hit is very high. 
if you have more than a seizure per day, longer seizure duration, and as you might expect, the more drugs you use. Now I will show you as we get on the lecture that these are the factors that are very commonly seen in the kids that we treat for epilepsy surgery. Now why is it this is epileptic encephalopathy takes place? And I go, this is, this is old material, and it's bring back your days in medical school, but it's worth re-emphasizing. One of the big differences in human cortical development is the increase in the brain size in the first two years of life. This isn't neuro neurogenesis, it's mostly synaptogenesis. And you can see that the brain weight, you know, increases substantially over the body, what mean body weight. Kids, you know, anyone that's a parent knows this. Little babies have big heads relative to their small bodies. Very characteristic. So if you think about this, during these first few years of life, what do the epilepsy, what do the seizures do? Well, I, my best analogy to this is think of your brain as if it's a PC, your laptop, whatever you got. And so, what is a seizure? A seizure is when your brain gets taken over and by this massive electrical event, similar to when your brain or your PC freezes. Too many programs running, it's trying to do too many things at one time, the CPU just says, oh, I can't handle this anymore, I quit. And your computer then shuts down. Well, in most times, you're in with a seizure, that's what your brain does. It uses whatever mechanism it can and it shuts down. Your brain then has to reboot, just like your PC be reboots. <clears throat> now, when, you have, when your PC reboots, does it work really great as soon as it gets back up? No, it takes some time, it has to find those files. It's, you know, it, it's confused. Well, it's kind of like your brain. So imagine that your brain is shutting down and having to reboot 50, 100 times a day. What's that going to do to the normal synaptogenesis, the normal synaptic learning that you expect to take place in that period of time? It's going to scramble it. So think of, your, think of an infant's brain as one in which it is constantly shutting down and rebooting. And it's that frequent attack by the, the seizures themselves that is leading to this cognitive delay. The other element, which is important to keep in mind, about seizures that we don't talk about to patients very much is the risk of death. Seizures are deadly. <coughs> and again, while a little bit deadly, but it's actually good data in the sense that in the, uh, after a bunch of clinical trials with new drugs, a group was able to pool all that data together and ask the question, what is the risk of dying? And the two biggest causes of death is sudden unexpected death due to epilepsy, SUDEP, or accidents. And if you look at the relative mortality rate and the reference, against the references, the mortality ratio for accidents in SUDEP is 10 times higher in children and never really goes to close to the population until you get over 55. <clears throat> Seizures are deadly. So when a family comes to talk about epilepsy surgery, I talk, I, I set up two things to talk about. What are the seizures doing to the developing brain, the epileptic encephalopathy, and what is the risk of your child from dying from the seizures? Because if you look at these kind of rates, these rates approach half of 1% per year. And those numbers have held up pretty strongly in now multiple studies. So if you have an uncontrolled seizure, refractory medical ma management, your risk of dying is about 1 in 200 per year. And it accumulates over the lifetime. So if you live 20 years with epilepsy, you've got about a 7, 8, 9% chance of dying from your seizures. That's certainly more 
and the risk of dying from an epilepsy surgery operation. So graphically, you should think about epileptic encephalopathy is like this. Normally, <coughs> child born and you know development in the first few years of life is incredibly rapid. By the time you get to the early, you know, early first decade, you reach your normal IQ. What do the seizures do? The seizures, in general, they don't make your development go backwards. What it does is that you fail to achieve normal milestones. So you don't roll over when you should. You shouldn't lift your head when you should. You don't walk when you should. You don't begin to do speak when you should. And so if you look in general, if you have uncontrolled seizures, the general trend is that you'll eventually end up with an IQ somewhere about 50. Now what's an IQ of 50 stand mean? It means you don't really know your name, you can't make change for a 20, although there's a lot of millennials that can't do that either. Um, you know, and you have trouble with just activities even of daily living. So this would be the impact from the seizures alone. So now to get back to my story. The story I'm going to talk about is a story that began at UCLA in 1986 with these four gentlemen. Don Shields, who was the head of pediatric neurology at the time, an EEGer named Alan Schumann, Harry Shigani, who was a, had gotten a Department of Energy grant to do and had access to do FDG PET, as we had one of the few FDG PET scanners in the country, and the new arrival in 1986 of a neurosurgeon from South Africa named Warwick Peacock. He had trained in Toronto. And at the time, when he was sort of discovered, was the only pediatric neurosurgeon south of the Sahara Desert. <laughs> you can imagine what his practice was. <coughs> so, in studying kids with infantile spasms, <clears throat> Alan made the interesting observation that if you look carefully at their EEGs, in some of the kids, there were signs of abnormalities referable to one side. Now I come from UCLA. Now at UCLA, because Pete Engel trained in the UK, we do right over left montages. So a few EGs I'm going to show are going to show that. But here's an example where you got interical discharges referable to one side. Alan also then made the observation that certain other normal features such as um, sleep spindles and K-complexes were better formed on one side versus another, suggesting an asymmetry. Harry Shigani uh, was able to make the following option. Now, believe it or not, this is an MRI from UCLA in the 1980s. Our first MRI scanner was a 0.3 Tesla magnet. Okay. Many places had 0 0.3, 0 0.5 Tesla magnets. And the MRI was read at the time as normal. Harry, because he was able to do this FDG PET on these kids, found that in some of the kids there were focal areas of hypometabolism <coughs> here referable to the left posterior quadrant. And through a series of meetings, those four got together and proposed operating based on the FDG PET and the asymmetries on some of the EEG on a bunch of kids. And this was the first paper published on this in 1990 by Harry. It's kind of interesting in that if you look at this, they reported four kids, they had 13 in which they reported the findings. Four of these kids went forward to surgery. And they were seizure-free postoperatively in the majority of cases. In the four cases that they operate on, they found cortical dysplasia in four of them, suggesting the idea that you could have a zone of cortical abnormality that producing the seizures that was MRI occult or negative. 
And this was one of the founding principles that was put together. So most centers, including ours, when we look at epilepsy surgery, we think of it in the following sort of way. We look for congruence of information that all point to the same place. We look for evidence of, of whether the sensory or exam deficits, image positivity, and an EEG that, depending upon how crucial you want to be, the EEG can be in the neighborhood or in some places it has to be spot on. And if all those things line up, then those patients are referred for a surgical resection and for a fusion of focal abnormality. In the case of the infantile spasms kids, it was noted that these things could be much broader. You could have a unihemispheric change in the EEG. You could have um, MRI findings, PET findings that were, in general, get you to where you want to go. But the point is, you didn't need to necessarily localize the ICL onset zone. If you got most of this to line up and you had a target, that would be sufficient for what you needed to do. So, it does not require that you identify an ectal onset zone. You only have to require the area of cortex or the circuit, to use a more modern <coughs> term we're talking about. What is the circuit or area that needs to be removed in order to achieve the seizure freedom? All right, so how does this work in practice? Okay, so let me show you some examples here. Right, an example. And I'm going to tell you William's story. William, he came to us at one year of age, and if you watch, he will suddenly kind of stop. His eyes will roll up, and he just had a seizure. He'd been tried on two or three meds. He was doing 50 seizures a day. By EEG, ictal onsets were referable to the right side. Imaging was concordant, so we took him to the operating room. And uh, this is my version of the hemispherotomy, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But here, and so we take out enough and disconnect the remaining portion. So, stop the seizures, one year of age. So, what happens to him? So here he is. And this is from compulsive parents with video cameras. You can see him sitting up. It's what referred to as the butt crawl. The butt scoot. Walking on his knees. So eventually he walks, walks pretty well, and here he is playing soccer at age five. Is he smacking the ball hard? No, but he's running, playing, doing good things. Is it mo just motor or is there some stuff, stuff, other stuff going on? So, again, you can't hear him, but he's talking. Yeah, so he's going to school for his first day. He says, I'm going to school, Mom. <laughs> Here he is counting, <clears throat> and he accurately counts all the pieces on his plate. He's starting to read, age five. So remember, this was a kid who was having multiple seizures per day, bad epilepsy, less than one year of age. <clears throat> His IQ was slated to be 50 or less had we not done an intervention. <coughs> and here he is doing math. Now, is he normal? No. As you can see, he's got a paretic hand. And that paretic hand, he has difficulty using it. 
So years later, when we came back and looked at the question of how do we impact these kids with infantile spasms in their development? And one of the problems is what are the, what are the metrics that you might use in this case? Well, it turns out that we don't have a metric that can assess IQ or developmental quotients that span the lifetime of individuals. The closest we can do is a Vineland adaptive score, which is roughly equivalent to an IQ. And when we retrospectively look and ask the question, what, is our, what did the surgery do with regards to their Vineland scores? And specifically look over here in the pre versus post group. We will show that those that we operate on at the time of surgery, if they had active infantile spasms, we got a little bit of improvement in their DQ. The best improvement we got were in those kids who had had a history of infantile spasms that had been controlled initially with pharmacological therapy, usually ACTH, now by Gabitrin, where we got a 14 point jump in their developmental quotients after surgery. And then we didn't do so well in those kids who had no history of spasms that we operated on. But the critical factor that came up out of all this was when we looked at seizure duration as an impact, it became pretty clear that once you got beyond four, five years of seizures, the number of kids that we had with a developmental quotient above 50 dropped. So the window of opportunity to impact <coughs> was within, only within the first few years. You can't let these kids go on and seize for a bunch of years and then do the surgery and hope to get a lot of developmental growth out of it. You had to do it early enough in the, in the course of disease. So if you think about it from a schematic point of view, and I go back to this, this is the following way. Here's normal development. Had you not done an intervention in these kids, this is the expected development that you would expect with an IQ somewhere around 50. If you do an intervention and stop the seizures, we don't make them normal. What we do is we can get them on a developmental course that's the, the scope of which is closer to normal. And in so doing then, minimize the impact of the epileptic encephalopathy. But the other important point to this is as follows. The time at the intervention then is critical. The further out you go, and thus the worse the developmental situation is before you do the intervention, then the least you can get out in the long run. And that is true no matter what. So if, you, if someone then refers you a patient in their 20s who's been seizing for the last 20 years, and they now have this Lennox-Gastaut syndrome and they've got a slow spiking wave and they're just developmental wrecks, <coughs> I can't make them normal. That horse is out of the barn, it jumped the fence, it jumped the county, it's gone, it's gone to another state. So your window of opportunity is sooner the better. And that's the point I would try to would take home is the single most important thing from a concept point of view. Surgery doesn't make kids normal. What you can do is minimize, at present, the impact of the epileptic encephalopathy. And the time to do it is sooner. So the sooner you can identify those kids and stop their seizures, the better. Now, after this concept came out, you know, one of the best, best form of flattery is when others kind of recapitulate your work. And that's what we've seen over time. So in this study that came out from the Cleveland Clinic, looking at um, developmental outcome in kids who had surgery and their age for three years, um, they showed a DQ improvement in 17, and about two-thirds of their cases became seizure-free. Extending the concept uh, was another paper that came out looking at a particular type of epilepsy in which there's continuous spike wave discharges, usually at night, we call this ESES or CSWS. Most of these kids had unihemispheric destructive pathologies like perinatal strokes. They got a good chunk of seizure free and developmental quotients improved in 
about three quarters of them. In other words, stopping the epileptic encephalopathy. And finally, in a group out of, uh, published out of Korea, those, these were kids with Lennox Gastaut, slow spiking wave and severe developmental epilepsy. Again, mostly unihemispheric pathologies, and they were able to get seizure freedom at about 60% and developmental quotient in almost three quarters that improved. So these, so you can impact, but again, we haven't made it better. All right, so making surgeries safer. So this was something I was involved with. So when I first took over the program, so Ward Peacock left UCLA in 1997, took a job up in San Francisco. And so I took over the program. And so one of the things that first kind of hit me was, can we make this a little bit better? In the sense that, our, I mean, we never, we lost one child we lost two kids in the time that Ward was the surgeon there. Both were very young kids, and they died from blood loss. So this was not a 100% <coughs> safe surgery. So I began thinking, can we make this a little bit easier or better? So the operation we were doing at the time, which Ward had been trained to do, was an anatomic hemispherectomy, where you basically take out all of that hemisphere, leaving just a little bit of the basal ganglia and as attached. And so the issue there has to do with um, how do you approach it. If you look at the cases that you are given, many of which have dilated ventricles. And, and when you have a dilated ventricle and a atrophic hemisphere, taking out the hemisphere isn't so bad. And this was what we're, this was going back to the days of the early, first hemispherectomies, which was by Cranham, who was a South African neurosurgeon of all things. The challenge has to do when you deal with something like this. This is a kid with hemi-megencephaly where the ventricle on the side you want to operate on is this plastic, malformed, and tiny as heck. So how can you do this? Well, we had had a surgeon visiting us for a while, a man named Yosef Kumer. Yosef had trained in Montreal where he had been had learned the Rasmussen style functional hemispherectomy. And I noted that those cases, the problem with those cases is that they did reasonably well from a blood loss point of view, but they didn't get the seizure control because they were leaving segments of the basal ganglia behind. So I adopted a process a procedure where we took out a window, a large block in the central area. And then from within that block, which gets you into the ventricle, you can then, from within the ventricle, disconnect this hemisphere from the other side through the corpus callosotomy and the other connections. And it was a modification that I added. So I began doing that in the late 90s. And by the early aughts, we had enough cases in which I could then compare three <coughs> techniques. The anatomic hemispherectomy, the Rasmussen style functional hemispherectomy, and then a more hemispherotomy style that I was doing. And so this is just some of the data that we generated from that. So here the key was to look at blood loss. So the key number here you want to look at, so we start, if you look and calculate, take the starting hematocrit times the blood volume, the ending hematocrit times the blood volume, plus the blood that you gave. You can then create a number. And the key number here is 30. When you get to 30 cc's, that's a total body transfusion. And if you break it down by type of procedure and the type of operation, it became pretty revealing. When we did anatomic hemispherectomies in kids with hemimegencephaly, we were generally averaging a four to five total body transfusion to get the kid through surgery. Even with this cortical display did not have any We were doing transfusions, transfusions. And by adopting a more limited resection, more disconnection, we were able then to change our blood loss significantly across the different etiologies. In addition, we were able then to reduce the number of days in the intensive care unit, 
from an average of nine or ten in the anatomic group to three or four, and the total hospital stay was reduced, all because we just changed the techniques. So these are again contributions that we can make. So from a neuroimaging perspective, <coughs> the next thing we wanted to try to get address was <coughs> identifying cortical dysplasia when it's overt, type two in the current classification. It's turning out to be pretty straightforward with imaging, MRI. The issue is, what about the more subtle forms? So working with Noriko Salman, we combined the technique of using MRI and then taking FDG PET, pseudo coloring it, and then when you overlay the FDG PET onto the MRI, you get to pick up distinct differences. And here's just one case. Four and a half year old, four seizures a day. We had lateralization and then our seizures were coming from the right side. And outside MRI had been as normal. And most people, even at 1.5T, you might suspect something there, but you have to be looking pretty carefully. But when we did the FDG PET overlay, the area of hypometabolism mapped out beautifully to a specific area of cortex. And then we, we then added on to it, in this case we overlaid a MEG study, and the MEG dipoles localized to the same area. So in this circumstance, all the ducts lined up, and we then were are, are, and still do perform resective surgery without a grid because we have the zone of cortical abnormality with our, and have been reasonably successful at that. And these turn on often to be a type two or type one cortical dysplasia, which then raised the important question about how good is MRI in identifying the cortical dysplasias? And the answer is, depends on where the MRI is done and who interprets it. In our own review of cases, if a uh, scan was done in the community, only 15% of the cases with type 1 dysplasias were properly identified. Whereas if you, if it was read by our radiologist, who's now, Noriko has become very acute, can, you can prove that quite substantially. So we still have room for improved neuroimaging in detecting abnormalities in these kids. Now, what is the epidemiology of epilepsy surgery for kids? And for this, I thank the collaboration with Ann Berg. Ann Berg is an epidemiologist, PhD, but she was able to do something that has not been done since. In the 1990s, she got 16 of 17 pediatric neurologists in the state of Connecticut to collaborate. And all kids with new onset epilepsy, she recruited into a cohort. She collected these cases from 1993 to 1997, a total of 600 kids. She was able, through her grant, to get 85% of these kids imaged on a Yale scanner. And she was able then to follow them. She followed them for over 12 years. And she asked me if I wanted to help her involved with trying to figure out what was the role of imaging and surgery in these kids. Well, we looked through this and we found some interesting things. If you split the cases, again, 85% of the cohort that had imaging, into two groups, what she called the traditional idiopathic. It's, in today's terminology, idiopathic general, uh, the idiopathic epilepsy. So these are the Atlantic epilepsies, the um, three hertz frontal, frontal lobe spike and wave. You found that imaging, that 31% fit into that, which is consistent with epidemiological studies in other pediatric groups. For the others, about a third were drug resistant. Only 10% here were drug resistant. So again, pretty consistent with uh, epidemiology. When you look at imaging, Imaging was negative in this idiopathic group in 97%. It was only positive in five, and none of those cases were drug resistant. However, in the other group, nearly tw one in five was image positive. And if you were image positive, 
the, possibility, the probability of being drug resistant rose to over 50%, which indicates then that one of the first major predictors of whether you're going to be drug resistant with pediatric epilepsy is if your image is positive. In fact, when we look more carefully, of those cases in her cohort that were image negative, trying different drugs, she, the, out of that group, about a third, 30%, were able to get some sort of seizure control upwards of 10 years out from surgery. However, only one of the cases that was image positive was controlled after failure of two drugs. Now this is kind of key. So we don't, you don't need to try a dozen drugs to figure out if somebody's refractory to epilepsy. <coughs> two drugs, and if you don't, still don't have seizure control and you are image positive, your chances of seizure control on drugs alone is now less than 5%, okay? Okay, you don't have, you know, you know, this is very clear. The other point was that if you then look at just the total number of cases with or without imaging, and those that eventually went on to epilepsy surgery, this is not a big group. Of all the kids that presented with new onset seizures, only about four or five percent really go on to having focal enough to epilepsy and a workup that goes forward to surgery. And my guess is that while it's never been done in the adult population, I don't think this number is that much bigger. I mean, we, we quote one-third of individuals with epilepsy or medically refractory, and then some groups will say that as much as 50% of those are surgical candidates. I don't believe it. I think the number is much, much smaller. I think the number is certainly under 10 and probably more like 5. So again, this is not a big population. So if you do the math, there's about 4 million live births in the United States every year. For those kids under 16, you would expect in the United States about 1,700 epilepsy surgery operations in the United States. <coughs> Our best guesstimate is that on an annual basis, there may be 500 cases in the U.S. per year. So this is another underserved population, very similar to the adult group in the sense that there just isn't enough cases being done, cases are just being missed. All right, so moving on. What are the clinical characteristics of epilepsy surgery in kids? And for this, this is a distinct collaboration I was able to help go forward with with um, Helen Cross in my years working with ILE. So between 2004 and 2007, we had an international survey asking groups for a single year if they would contribute data as to the cases they did within that single year. And we eventually got 46 centers from around the country, around the world, to contribute cases. Most in North America, Seattle is listed, I believe. Um, but we were then put together and we were able to then, so these centers again from all over the world, mostly Europe and the North America, but we did get Middle East, uh, we had Africa, we didn't, there was a program that was just starting in South Africa at the time, we didn't know that they existed. So we had pretty decent representation. So if you then pull that together, so it's a total of about 1,100 cases for that one year. And if you look at the features of the patients, some things will start looking about the same. So if you look at the resected cases, total of about 800 out of that whole group, and you ask age of seizure onset, 50% by the first two years of life. Again, remember that group of epileptic encephalopathy, first two years of life is key. So, this is very characteristic of that group. Duration of epilepsy before surgery. Remember I said two years was kind of the critical mark? Only about a third of the cases got to surgery within two years of onset. Many went out very long times. And in the adult population, George, I'm sure you're familiar with this, I mean, histories of 30 years, 35 years, we're seeing people now in their 60s who've had seizures since they were in their teens, never referred for an epilepsy evaluation. I mean, it's a crime, it's an absolute friggin' crime. 
seizure frequency. Now this were, we only recorded down to daily, but you can see two thirds of the cases in our group were having daily seizures. Again, that very high risk of of the epileptic encephalopathy. If you ask the workup that was done, it was kind of interesting. Virtually everybody had video EEG and some sort of imaging, mostly MRI. Other tests were highly variable, and at the time when we conducted the survey, about 30% went on to have phase two or intracranial electrodes of some form in order to be able to go forward with surgery. So a lot of these cases are being done still at that time without invasive recordings. Look at the type of recordings or type of resections. Most, I mean, most are focal. Hemispheric operations were only about one in five. And if you look then at if they were multifocal, uh, they involve the temporal lobe more often than not. So the holdover in kids is still that it's a lot of adult programs trying to do surgery in kids, thinking like adult people with, and thinking of temporal lobe epilepsy. If you look at, again, location, temporal and frontal are the most common. But that's true, there just aren't etiologies in the parietal and occipital lobe that are very common. When you look at the underlying histopathology, the most common thing identified was cortical dysplasia in kids. Tumor is the second most common. Hippocampal sclerosis, which is something that the adult groups see pretty regularly, is number four in the list. And hemimag, I mean, then they get into the rare birds, hemimag encephaly, tuber sclerosis, etc. If you combine hemimag with the cortical dysplasia group, you end up with nearly a 40% rate. By comparison, if you look at adult series, and this is primarily from Igmar Blumke's work from, in Germany, all cases of epilepsy surgery end up in the hands of one neuropathologist. Hippocampal sclerosis is, again, the most common. The second most common in the adult series is, is tumors. Cortical dysplasia comes in number three. Usually the cases that the pediatric groups just didn't get or they weren't identified. So some examples. Here's a kid. Where's the cortical dysplasia? You gotta look pretty carefully at the residents. If you look, you'll see an increase in density in the subcortical white matter here. And my FDG PET, that's the area of hypermetabolism. And so this is the way I get to look at, at kids in surgery, so to keep everyone oriented, the eyeball is here and the ear is over here. And one of the things that I noticed, as you notice here, is that the cortical surface in these, these cases are not particularly at that at normal. There's a little bit of gyral enhancement or broadening, but it's not particularly bad. Take another case. Here's a case in this almost lysencephalic like. See this long head of cortex here. Again, metabolic. And at surgery, you see this very broad middle temporal gyrus that goes all the way back, a very gorged and thick cortical veins, kind of typical. And then the worst case, here's a case of hemimagencephaly, and then surgery here, oriented the other way, finding the sensory cortex, the motor sensory cortex, I mean, it's kind of a divot here that suggests that this is where it should be, but the anatomy just, just doesn't work out so well. By histopathology, cortical display is very characteristic in that there is a hyper number of neurons, especially in the subcortical white matter, such that you don't get this differentiation between cortex and white matter very well. By imaging, the typical characteristics for the more severe forms include increased cortical thickness, blurring of the gray-white matter interface, and sometimes you can see signal change in the underlying cortical white matter. But it's not always that way. So here's an example. Where's Waldo? Where's the cortical dysplasia? Look carefully. If you look really carefully, you can see that there's some changes that are here. Again, difficult to attempt to differentiate. Or here, where's the cortical dysplasia? 
this case, a very thick and high cortex in the insular area. And it's interesting, when you look at the outcomes for seizure surgery in cases of cortical dysplasia, if you look at the centers and how many of them had, quote, normal MRIs and the percentage of cases that then had mild cortical dysplasia, what we refer to as type 1s, you see quite broad variability. But in general, centers in which if they recorded never operating on a normal MRI, never found a type 1 cortical dysplasia. Whereas those that did, quote, operate on, quote, normal MRIs had a pretty high rate of finding mild cortical dysplasia. So in our research studies in the 1990s, we wanted to begin to understand what was potentially the cause for the seizures. And so working with Carlos, we would take cortical specimens, run them across the street, where he would then do slices and begin to record from those cells, normal and abnormal cells, in the dish. And over the years, we've described several types of display of cells that we record from. Balloon cells. These are these large, gymnastocytic-like cells that have characteristics more like astrocytes than they do of neurons. Cytomegalic neurons that we call that are pyramidal in shape that we record from. A new class of cells that had previously not been described that are large cells that have interneuronal characteristics by morphology and by electrophysiology. And then a group of cells that look very immature and that they are not totally grown up. So the first thing we learned was balloon cells look like, walk like, talk like, and act like glia. If you, if you fill them, they have these interesting characteristics. If you look at their voltage, it, you can jazz them all you want. You can, hard, you can never get them to fire under current clamp. And if you spritz things on them, like cane 8 acid and MDA, you cannot get them to depolarize. There are some cells, though, that are interesting, very rare. I think we record like two over 10 years that have both glial and neuronal phenotypes. But these, again, are very, very rare. And they, too, when you study them, look like glia. Cytomegalic neurons, on the other hand, were different. Very large with a pyramidal type of shape. In this case, if you were able, if you took them to firing threshold, they fired, and they would continue to fire, and it would be blocked with cadmium. So it was indicating that these were calcium-based voltage-gated cal calcium currents. But we never saw them spontaneously depolarize. So they're kind of like amplifiers. On the other hand. We had other uh, cells, especially in the, um, that were more immature, that had spontaneous inward currents. And if you then block, you could block these currents with bicuclea, indicating that these inward currents were GABA mediated. And then one of our postdocs that was with us for several years, Veronique Andre, in her work, <coughs> was able to identify a group of cells that if you label in the tissue with neuroin and GAD, or a combination, you could see a cells of cytomegalic character that labeled with GAD. She was able to disassociate some of those cells, and in dis disassociating them was able then to do individual western blots and found a number of these cells, like here, that labeled both with GAD 67 and 65, and v glute which is one of the enzymes associated again with GABAergic neurons. And so these were characteristics of GABAergic interneurons, large cytomegalic neurons that are GABAergic. When those cells were then, could then be identified and sliced, they turned out to be interesting in that 
they too can fire and sometimes spontaneously de depolarize. So these cells, which are, we only see them in the more severe forms of cortical dysplasia, are the one touch cell type that indeed seem to have this propensity to discharge. The other interesting feature that when we looked at just <coughs> spontaneous synaptic activity in cases of cortical dysplasia, recording both mixed glutamate and GABA, what came out of all of this was very interesting. The more severe the cortical dysplasia, the fewer glutamatergic inputs as compared to the more normal cases. Now, initially you kind of go, how is this? This is tissue that's seizing. Shouldn't the glutamate be uh, higher? Well, until you stop and think about it a little bit, during normal cortical development, the first neurotransmitter that you have in the cortex is GABA. And GABA turns out to be depolarizing. And only then towards very close to term do you begin to get glutamatergic input and there's a shift from more GABA to glutamate. So if indeed this tissue is more dismature or immature, having fewer glutamatergic inputs actually makes sense. And if we went on again to look at these cells, some of these GABAergic interneurons were turned out to be really interesting in that they phase fire. They would spontaneously it along. I mean, so if you're talking about if there is such a thing as an epileptic neuron, the candidate I would give you would be a cytomegalic GABAergic interneuron that has the potential to do that. Again, though, they don't see them as frequently as you should. And some of these cells then fire just in regular trains. So this was this is work we've been going on for many, many years. Second most common etiology in kids is tumors. Here's an example here, tumor sitting here, you know, contrast enhancing. We don't see as many tumors with epilepsy UCLA. Our tumor people seem to get a hold of it. And the data on the tumors, the best data that I've seen has been some stuff that came out of San Francisco recently, and this still is unresolved. A lot of people that present with new onset seizures get sent in, get an image, they end up with a tumor, they end up in the hands of an oncology surgeon. But if you look, seizure control, if, you, if somebody has uncontrolled seizures when they have their tumor surgery, the percent seizure free is only about half. It should be more. And I think this still represents an area where we, we still collide with our oncology neurosurgeons as to what the best thing to do. Atrophic etiologies, this is a kid with hemi, hemi, uh, an infantile stroke. And in surgery, this is what it looks like to, for me, big cystic cavities. Here's something that on the adult side you should see rather, rather frequently, hippocampal sclerosis. Uh, although I still think that's an that's a improper term to use by imaging. Uh, hippocampal sclerosis should be a histopathologic diagnosis. What we're seeing more of is tuber sclerosis. This is a kid, interesting case. Identical twins. I've operated now on both kids. The first kid presented with seizures early in life. At the time we were experimenting with, um, with um, MEG. We were able to get this kid to an MEG scanner and in the scanner she had a seizure which localized to a very specific tuber. Took her to the operating room got that tuber. That was now 12 years ago and she's remained seizure free. Her identical twin had a Sega that grew. I ended up having to take that one out. Uh, gelastic seizures and hyperplanic hamartomas. This is now an area that people are finally getting you know, good handles on with laser treatment. This is Sturge Weber, which in surgery looks like this. And then one of the worst diseases that have to deal with is something called Rasmussen encephalitis, named after a neurosurgeon, who did comment in the last lecture I ever heard from him saying, of all the things I'm going to be known for, this is not what I wanted to be known for in my life. But surgery is this very diffuse area. Outcomes, if you look at the survey, overall seizure-free rate was about 55%, but it was 
is predicated on two things. If, he, if a person was image positive, the class 1A outcomes were much higher than those that were MRI negative. And if it was deemed that they had a complete resection, seizure control rates are much higher than if they were incomplete. So there's two factors for epilepsy surgery. Where's the lesion, and did you get it all out? It's really pretty simple. In our own data, we've looked at whether, so we've had a program since 86, have we done better over time? And the answer is yes. Work that Jay Hoffman helped me with. When we look at different eras over five-year periods, the percent of patients that were seizure-free and stayed seizure-free went up over the decades that we've operated. Well, the number of kids that we did not get seizure control has gone down. We've looked at cases of infection, especially after hemispherectomy. What I can tell you is its risk is really low. Of 100 consecutive cases, we've only had, we had 16 infections. Most were not in the CNS. And identifying those kids who had CNS infections after surgery was very difficult. White counts and this did not help. We've also looked at things like what were the factors that got kids referred to us? And in our hands, having had active infantile spasms or a previous history of spasms or at least daily seizures got them referred to us much quicker. Private insurance and whether, and it turned out in our hands that if they were Hispanic in origin, they got to us sooner. In fact, to the point where our best group were those that Hispanic families that had insurance got to us much quicker. And um, <coughs> just improvement. So genetics, I'll just have to quit real quick because we're running out of time. One of the observations we made a long time ago was that when we looked at these cases, there seemed to be an abundance, too many neurons that were in the right place. So in the work we did with Joe Gleason, we took advantage of the fact that I've been storing some of this tissue for a long time. So we took tissue that I've been storing from the surgery did genetic analysis on it, and then use a reference. In this case, we took saliva or blood, and then subtracted the two and said, is there something that we find in the brain that we didn't find in the blood? And the answer was yes. And in roughly now 40% of our patients with hemimegencephaly, we find abnormalities and gene defects resulting in a somatic mutation in the PI3K pathways. Uh, Joe was able to reproduce this by then using a model in a mouse and was able to reproduce many of the clinical phenotype in the mouse, including large splastic cells, problems with migration, and the presence of EEG abnormalities referable to those areas. So we're beginning to get a handle a little bit on the genetics of this. Finally, I'll end with this. Um, in academic neurosurgery, I think it's very important that we maintain that we work with our patient problem groups. I've had the privilege of working with several groups now in order to try to get them to be more proactive. And so to finish, thank you from my kids. And I thank you very much.